Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, one of the things that I just realized is not everybody watching this channel and wanting to build these projects knows how to read an electrical schematic. And I really feel like this isn't something you should really attempt without understanding how to read the schematic and know where each connection is without having to like step by step watch a video and like study what wires I have on which tag strip. You should be able to figure this out by reading the schematic and to me it's kind of like wanting to play a musical instrument but you don't know how to read music without being able to read what you're doing and understand what you're doing I just it's really not a good idea so anyway I decided let's make a short video series about reading schematics and to read tube amp schematics you don't need to know every symbol etc ever made because tube amps have a fairly limited types of devices inside them like resistors capacitors etc which you'll see in the video and so the first part I'm going to go over the symbols and kind of how to read those and understand what we're seeing and then in the second video I'm going to go through some schematics of some of the amps that I've built and some other amps that maybe going to build in the future and just kind of go through the system and the schematic and show you where everything is and how things are interconnected. So without wasting any more time, let's get watching. Okay, first let's go over and look at the symbols that schematics use. First one we're going to look at is this is what the symbol for a resistor looks like. And it's one of two kinds. This is by far the most common. This one on the left that has the multiple, you know, zigzaggy looking things. Resistors are normally labeled with an R, but not necessarily. But when they are given numbers, they're usually an R. And then here's the value. It's a 1K or a 1000 ohm. And here's the ohm symbol. And again, here's the ohm symbol. And... That's a 230 ohm resistor. Here's two other kinds you will see. This one, not so much in a tube amp. This is a variable resistor where when you adjust the knob or however it adjusts the slider, the value of the resistor across the two terminals change. This is a much more common one. This is what volume controls and also the bias potentiometers that adjust the bias on fixed bias tube amps. But this is used a lot for, or this is exclusively for, volume controls. The signal would be attached here. This side would go to ground. This would go to the grid of the first tube. And as you move it up and down, it either gets closer to the original signal or closer to ground and so it varies the volume. Here are the symbols for capacitors. This is an older one and it's also used for non-polarized film caps. Sometimes you'll see schematics that use this two straight line one and it'll have like a plus or a plus and a minus on it to show that it's polarized but this one is definitely the polarized type the curved part always goes to the negative and there's usually a plus symbol showing which way the positive of the capacitor is. Okay, here's your basic on-off switch and obviously when this swings down and makes the connection it turns on. And so they're drawn like this. Sometimes this circle is not hollow or usually isn't. It's just a dot. But this is what a SPST or a single pole single throw switch looks like in schematic form. 
Here's a couple of more switches that you will see. One is a single pole double throw and that allows you to switch the signal or electrical path between two different poles and this is used for like the ultralinear triode switches and things like that. This is used more for switching between various inputs. If you wanted to have you know, three or four different inputs on your amp that you could switch between, it would be a single pole three throw or four throw or five throw or whatever it is. Sometimes these are rotary switches, but that's what the symbol looks like for a multi-pole switch. This is a double pole double throw switch and this dashed line signifies that these are electrically isolated but mechanically connected. So when you throw the switch both of these lever things move to the other pole. And so these are your poles over here and these are where the input signal would come through and then you could switch between two different outputs. And so that's what a double pole double throw switch looks like in a schematic symbol form. Okay, the next one is a fuse and sometimes these have more of an S shape than this one has kind of a sharper kind of a angle to it, but when you see something like this, that's a fuse. This is a thermistor, which is a resistor that changes value as it warms up. And they normally have a high resistance value that turns into a low resistance value as they warm up. And these are used to limit the current inrush on an amp when you first turn it on. Normally, we would use these with like a solid state rectified or if you're using a directly heated rectifier tube, sometimes they put these in to limit the amount of current rushing into the amp to fill up the capacitors when you first turn it on so that it doesn't blow the fuse or cause any other damage to a component. Okay, light bulbs. This is what is supposed to be used. I rarely see anyone use this symbol for an electric light bulb. This is more what I see is this little squiggly that's symbolizing the filament for an incandescent light bulb. And then this is for a neon lamp, which is sometimes used for an indicator as they can run off 120 volts and they're small and don't get hot. So if you see this symbol, that's what it's for, is for a neon lamp, usually in the power supply indicator circuit. Okay, here we've got transformer schematic symbols. And this is your basic transformer. That's your primary, and this is your secondary. On this one, they have little dots here, which symbolize the phasing of the transformer. So if it's important that the transformer stays in phase, they have these dots to show you that pin one and pin three will keep it in phase. This one here is symbolizing a center tapped transformer. And this could be like an output transformer. And if it was a single ended one, your B plus would go here. This would be your ultralinear tap. And then that would be going to the plate. It could also be a push pull output transformer where the B plus or the high voltage DC would go on this terminal. And then this terminal and this bottom terminal would go to the plates of the two output tubes. And then this would be your speaker output in that case where you would put the speaker terminals. This could also be a center tap for a power supply transformer or could be, you know, center tap for anything. So that's, that's how a center tap transformer is drawn in a schematic. Okay, this symbol is for an inductor or a choke. I normally call them chokes, but a lot of people call them inductors. Uh, you could use either term. They're drawn like this most of the time. I've rarely seen them drawn like this in some really old schematics, and I honestly have never seen one drawn like this, but 
I guess if it's a solid in box like this, that's the symbol for an inductor. An inductor usually is labeled with an L as far as a numbering system. And then it'll have the Henry's, which is this capital H, and that's like millihenries, etc. So it gives you the value of the choke that you're going to be using. Okay, these are symbols that are used to designate voltage and where it's coming from and how much it is. These two are what I normally see. Never seen this one used in a schematic, but you might run across it. To me, it's too confusing with this one, but I guess if it's got the line going through the middle of it, it's considered a positive one. Normally, it'll be labeled like this. This is called V+, plus, but in a tube amp, only ever seen it called B plus and so they sometimes will have the voltage here and be designated in that way this VCC is something that you see used with integrated circuits and that kind of stuff so you'll be seeing either the voltage called out or just simply B plus for the grounds don't see this one a whole lot but I've seen it in a schematic or two here and there so be aware that you see this just a single line that's at you know 90 degrees make an upside down T shape that that can be a ground symbol seeing this used in the computer modeled diagrams but it's not something I normally see in a hand drawn schematic this one's much more common and this is the one I normally use when I'm drawing up a schematic with the multiple lines in a kind of triangle shape and that's your obvious ground symbol. So we'll go over a few solid state components that you might see in a tube amp. One is your basic diode. And they're always drawn like this. This line here corresponds to the line that's on the body of the diode. And so when you're orienting the diode in your circuit, make sure this line on the body of the device is in the direction in the circuit that the diode is supposed to be as shown in the diagram. Here we have an LED and these are supposed to be like the light rays coming off of the diode. The other one that you'll see sometimes on screen supplies or in preamp power supplies or Zener diodes and they're drawn like this. Okay, let's go over some of the basic schematic symbols for the tubes themselves. These are two different types of rectifier tubes. This is an indirectly heated rectifier and two and eight would be the heater filaments and eight is where you take your high voltage DC off of the rectifier tube because it's connected directly to the two cathodes that are heated by the heaters. Then four and six are the two plates that hook to each end of the power transformer. Now this 5U4 tube has directly heated cathodes and so the voltage is taken directly off the filament on pin 8. Again, 4 and 6 are your plates that go to the power transformer. And sometimes when a 5AR4 is put into an amp, they still draw the diagram like this and they don't draw all these elements in because at the end of the day it really doesn't matter. Okay, now here are the four common tube types that we're going to see in an audio amplifier. This first one is a direct heated triode. And that means that there's no separate cathode. The heater filament itself is the cathode. So you have four pins. So these are the two heaters and the cathode is taken off of the center point between these two heaters. There's the grid, there's the plate. Now here's your basic indirectly heated triode. Again, plate, grid, cathode, and here are your heaters. Now in many schematics, this heater isn't drawn and the wiring to the heaters isn't drawn to try to simplify the schematic and to keep wires from going everywhere because hooking up the heaters is pretty simple and they 
mostly realize that they don't need to draw the heater wiring in with the signal wiring of the circuit. So when you see this kind of L-shaped cathode, understand that there is a heater and that you have to hook that up from the power supply. The other thing you'll see is sometimes you see a dashed line like this on one side of the tube or it may just be missing completely. And if that's the case, what that's signifying is that tube being used is a twin triode, like a 12AX7, and the circuit is showing one side of the triode in the tube. So realize that it's either being used for the other channel or it's being used in another section in the amp if it's got a two-stage or a you know cast code or some other kind of circuit design that the other side of the triode is being used in another part of the amplifier. Next we have your standard pentode like a 6V6 and again there's the heater, there's the cathode, but we've got some extra screens in here or grids. This is your signal grid. This is your suppressor which is internally connected to the cathode so you can't really do anything about that. It doesn't have its own pin. It's internally connected, but no, it's there. That's what makes it a pentode. Then the screen is taken out on this pin here, the screen pin, and there's the plate. Now there are a few tubes like the EL34 that pull the suppressor grid out to its own pin on the tube. And so this is a diagram showing that where you have the suppressor grid you have the screen grid, you have the signal grid, or just the plain grid as it's called, the plate, cathode, and the heaters. Now when we're looking at the wires, there's two different ways that diagrams are drawn. And it's usually all of one or all of another, but sometimes they kind of mix them up, so be aware of that. When lines cross like this, and the rest of the schematic shows a dot at connections. The ones without the dot aren't connected where they cross. They're only connected where there's a dot. Now, some of the older schematics, and I've seen even newer ones, some people just draw them like this, is they have a cross with them touching where they connect and then where they're not connected, they do a little loop up like this where they're, you know, kind of simulating the three-dimensional jumping up over and not touching. So if you see them drawn like this, the ones that don't loop up are connected at this center point. Sometimes you'll see them with dots and then they do the up loops like this. But given that these two are exactly the same looking, you'll never see a schematic where they have, assuming not connected and connected, drawn the same way. And I hope that makes sense. So these are some pinouts from the tube data sheets. And they show the internal structure of the tube. And then they show which pins each one of those elements is pulled out to on the base of the tube itself. This is looking at the tube from the bottom. So if you're looking at the tube socket from inside the amplifier like we will normally be working, the pins are numbered like this as well. So like on this tube, pins three and one are both the cathode, which is labeled with a K. G1 is the signal grid. H is for the two heaters. And these can be connected either way, even if it's AC, DC, doesn't matter. The heaters don't care which direction you have the current flowing through them. Okay, this pin here is labeled internal shield. And it doesn't really have to be connected, but it's probably a good idea to hook this to ground to make sure that the tube shielding inside the tube itself is working as good as it can. Here's P for the plate on pin 7. G2 is the screen, and it's on pin 8. And then G3 is pin 9, which is the suppressor 
screen and it would normally be connected to pin one just like the other tubes did internally but they can be used in other ways if you're trying to strap in the tube and that kind of stuff but we're not going to get into that in this video just know that some tubes pull the suppressor grid out many of them don't so here's a couple of other real common tubes this is a dual triode could be a 12x7, 12AU7. There's a whole family of, you know, 6S and 7s are also dual triodes, but this is the 9 pin dual triode. And one is the plate, two is the grid, three is the cathode. The heaters on these are fairly unique. They're dual voltage. They can either run on 12.6 or 6.3 volt. And we usually use them on 6.3 volts, so you would hook pins 4 and 5 together, put one side of the 6.3 volts here with these two pins connected together, and then put the other side on pin 9, which is the center point of the two heaters. Then 6 is the plate, 7 is the grid, 8 is the cathode. Here's an output tube, a KT88, but Many other tubes use this same pinout, these 8-pin power tubes. One's not connected. Two and seven are the heaters. Three's the plate. Four's the screen. Five is the signal grid. And then eight's the cathode. Pin six not, not connected to anything. And again, this is looking at the bottom of the tube and this little thing right here is signifying the keyway on the tube, so it makes it easy to identify which pins are on which position on the socket and on the tube. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the first video in this series and have a better understanding of what all the symbols that are used in schematics stand for. And understanding the symbols is kind of like understanding the alphabet. There are tools that you need to be able to read the schematic. And so in the next video, we're going to actually go through reading some schematics. So hopefully you understood what was in this video. If not, you might want to watch it a second time. And then the second video will actually put this knowledge to use reading actual schematics. And I hope you're enjoying my channel. If you are, please subscribe. Please like the video. And we'll see you soon. Have a great day.